Now I have you, you foolish adventurers. I will use my galactic power to destroy you. <laughs> you will take a thousand damage. <laughs> Wait, you're all dead? Like dead dead? Like can't even resurrect you dead? I, I'm so sorry. I, I had no idea. I was, I mean, I, I, I can roll again, can't I? I can, I can undo this. I can, I can. We had a save point, didn't we? We, uh, we, uh, oh dear. Do you want to make new ones? And we can try again. I, I promise I won't kill you this time. Hello. Welcome to How to Be a Great GM 102. Or in other words, how to set the difficulty of your encounters to keep your players coming back for more. Without killing them. We've all been there. We've all done it. I don't know of a single great GM who hasn't at some point accidentally created a character that's just too powerful for the party and has run the very severe risk of the party dying. It happens and there's nothing to worry about. Well, there is if you're continuously killing your party for no reason. So just how do you set up encounters? You now know the journey of how you tell a good story and how to engage the players and adjudicate decisions on what they do. But just how do you come up with that all-important encounter? Encounters are very difficult, and there have been many systems in the past that have sought to address the issue of just how to generate a good encounter. In the past, there was experience point values for creatures. There are challenge ratings where you do a whole lot of complicated math to try and work out that if the party's average level divided by their shoe size is 12.3, then you can throw one cobbled against them. There are all kinds of methods for working out the difficulty of an encounter, and none of them seem to work. Well, there's a very good reason for it. Most systems rely on something, whether it's a d20, a d6, or a percentile die, those little things are always going to work against you. So how do you mitigate that? And not even mitigating it, how do you make sure that your players can be happily rolling day after day after day and not succumb to statistical death? What I do, and those of you who love rules and who love balance, please close your ears. What I do is I go, the party level is four, or the party's gone through four sessions, or the party has plus 40% to their stat, whatever the mechanic that you're using, I go, well, the party's got X, Y, Z experience, so therefore the monster whatever it is, will have that much as a bonus to hit, to damage, to avoid incoming stuff. In other words, all those wonderful books on monsters, on alien species, on the fae, on the unnatural, on things from another realm, are really just to inspire me in terms of what my creatures look like and perhaps to give me a little insight into their behavior or their culture. But their actual stat blocks mean nothing. If I have my party going up against a great brown bear, and in one system the bear does 1d8 damage, and the party is breezing through it, it's posing no difficulty whatsoever. Everybody seems bored. Well... If that bear just seems to have an infinite number of hit points because I've decided to quintuple the amount of hit points that the bear should have, according to the book, it makes it a more interesting encounter. If my dragon, when it's sweeping its massive tail at the players, gets plus five to hit because the players are low level, well, perhaps it's an inept dragon. 
It's not an insta-death because they have made a mistake. So my advice for GMs when trying to set up an encounter for the first time is to ignore the barking of the dogs in the background. They must have seen a shadow or maybe the sun rising, but is to ignore the values in the book and to make the encounter entertaining. So if you have 20 goblins against the party, that's terrifying. And under normal circumstances, the goblins would have a mob rule, and they'd have a this rule, and they'd have a that percentile chance of destroying the entire party, and, 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 and. Ignore that. Have your goblins go rushing in. Have the first few dispatched with only one hit from the hero's swords. But then have them regroup. Have them start to cluster together. And as they work together as a team, their damage output starts going up or they start to pull adventurers down to the ground. And don't worry about those numbers. Just make them up. Have them become bigger and stronger as the fight goes on. Now, I'm not advocating that you make every encounter last for 20 years. That's not the point. Some encounters should literally be three rounds of combat, maybe even less. And that could be with some orcs, with goblins, with anything that is there simply to create a certain amount of tension or a certain amount of action. If it's a barroom brawl, three rounds, any longer than that, and it's become this major life or death battle, it shouldn't be. So not only are you going to be moderating your creature's statistics to make the game more interesting and to make them keep up with the level of the players. If the players have got five plus five to hit, well, the creature should have plus five to hit. It's only fair, isn't it? Maybe they have plus six if they're a war chief, or if you want to make it a particularly terrifying battle, give them plus seven. On the other hand, you don't want the combat to last too long either in most circumstances. When you have your big epic battle that you've been playing seven or eight or nine sessions to get to and your players walk in and kill the creature with one fell strike because they have plus 20 to damage and your creature's only got 100 hit points and they happen to roll all of the right numbers at all of the right times, that's not a very epic conclusion, is it? On the other hand, if your players do massive amounts of damage and the creature should have fallen down, and you say, the creature shrugs it off. The players might say, um, excuse me, Jim, uh, in, the, in the rule book, it says um, that this should only have 200 hit points, and we just did 200 hit points to it. You can say, the creature shrugs it off and gets a free attack. It breathes fire. You can't dodge. You take 40 damage. Are you still alive? And are you still asking me questions? No, you're not. Good. Carry on with the battle then. The monsters are there for you to use. Don't be intimidated by players who want to try and force you to use the stats of the creatures. Do all trolls regenerate? Not in my world. And they only do that if I want them to. Because players will cut a troll up into lots of little pieces and immediately set it on fire. Why do they do that? Because their characters know how to fight trolls? No because certain players have been playing games for many years and they know that trolls regenerate. Because the book says so. Who says the book's part of your world? doesn't have to be. It's only a reference. So your big titanic battles, your masterpiece scenes, your conclusion battle should never be a quick and simple thing, unless that is a false concluding battle. And that takes us into the false ending resolution 122 and 121 method, which there are videos of that you can go and watch. So the point I'm trying to make is when running encounters, don't just sit there looking at the numbers and be miserable when your numbers overwhelm the party's numbers or when the party's numbers overwhelm your creature's numbers, reducing your grand battle to two rolls and a flying pancake. It's not worth it. Tell the story. Let the creatures sometimes have more hit points. Let them have sometimes less hit points. What this does is it tells players, hey, I'm not sticking to tradition. This is a game you're going to enjoy because you are literally encountering every creature for the first time in your role-playing career. It doesn't matter whether it's been 20 years, 10 months, 2 days, or this is the first encounter you've ever had. You do not know what's going on in my world. You do not know these creatures. What that will do is it will help you to balance out the game. 
As the party starts to succumb to the creatures because they simply seem too powerful, don't be afraid to have the player swing a hit, hit one of the creatures, and have the rest of them declare that they've lost too many comrades and have turned and run away. In older systems, there used to be a morale uh, role where the characters, once they, well, when they were monsters, once they had lost a certain number of comrades or taken a certain number of hit points, would make a morale check, which was basically some kind of willpower check to stay in the fight. Once they decided that they couldn't possibly win, they would turn tail and run. Don't be afraid to have your monsters run away. And if PCs want to leave their comrades bleeding to death on the ground and run after the monsters, well, that's not your fault. That's their decision entirely. And that's a different story. So encounters don't need to be this major mathematical event. And what I often do when I'm planning for a session is I'll say, right, this session is supposed to be happening in a dungeon or this session is supposed to be happening in a forest. And I will skim through the various manuals that are issued with almost every type of game for the types of inhabitants that would be there. If we're in Cloud City, what can we expect? If we're on Vulcan, what can we expect? And it goes back to those expectations and the setting videos. And there are plenty of setting videos on this channel as well. Now, on the G How to Be a Great GM channel, if you really want. If you're, I'm confused. I blame the heat. So there are plenty of videos on this channel on how to set a encounter in an appropriate setting and what players are expecting. Now that I'm back on track, I apologize. I blame the drugs which I haven't taken, didn't take, won't take, never take. So the whole point is that you don't want to have encounters become these number crunches. You don't want encounters to overwhelm a new party. You don't want encounters to be underwhelming, in which case they're lackluster. And the only way that I have personally found to do that is by simply matching the numbers with the players and then deciding when is narratively correct for the creatures to surrender, to die, or to run away. Now, treasure is another story. How does one allocate treasure? And there are all sorts of interesting mathematical ways, and there's thousands of tables and reward values and all kinds of things equating to the type of monster for, to the this, to the that, and to the next thing. I ignore them all. Why should I do heavy math to determine what's happening in my world? If the goblins have treasure on it, it's because I've decided that they have treasure on it. And as the party is going through it, if I feel that the party is lacking something or if they could benefit from some kind of device or magical item, well, suddenly the goblins have got it. Just because some table somewhere says that goblins should only carry five copper and a dead cat doesn't mean that I have to listen to it. So often I'll say, well, the party needs to have some kind of device that allows them to get from point A to point B slightly faster. So one of the goblins happens to have in his backpack a treasure map with an indicator of Sherud's magical flying slippers as the target treasure which the map leads to. Not only does that give me a great adventure hook, but it gives the players a promise of some kind of treasure that their characters could get quite easily, and off they go on that. And of course I'll throw in some silver pieces here or there and some copper, and because I want my players to have as many hooks as possible, perhaps I shall put in the shoelace. Uh, from the prince's slipper, which may or may not be of value to the players, and they may or may not go off to the palace to see if they can get some kind of reward for the slipper shoelace that they have now found. Either way, the treasure allocation is very much up to me, and I know that there are people who like to have numbers and rigid forms of stats and maths because those monster encounters rely on the party having a certain amount of technological advancement or a certain amount of magical items and because I don't listen to the monster encounter values, I don't care what magical items they've got because my monsters will scale up depending on the PCs themselves. What I also find is that this is really helpful in terms of scaling monsters according to the party because if you have a party where you've got a whole lot of very, very well-armed knights and paladins running around and a few very, very, very weak scribes or bards or players who've got characters who just are not cut out for combat. To put the same type of orc against a warrior in plate mail and the same type of orc against a bard who's not very good at his spells and who isn't wearing very much armor, 
that bard is going to fall over dead. And the player is going to start to get nervous and regret combat every single time. However, if the orc that the bard is playing against happens to be a slightly weaker orc or is perhaps an orc with a limp, it makes the combat interesting. It makes the encounter a little bit more interesting that there's this orc with a limp. And how has an orc with a limp survived in an orc society? Well, perhaps it's because he's particularly crafty or perhaps it's because he's very good on his hands so that the orc is doing a handstand and fighting with his stumps. Who knows? The point is, make your encounters exciting for the players. Make it interesting and easy for yourself by just whitewashing all of those values and make the treasure feel as if it is worthy of the player's attention. I run games where players go, you know, we haven't got any, we haven't got any treasure in the last three sessions. We've got nothing. And I say, well, are you having fun? Do you need treasure? Do you need anything to make your game more interesting? They go, no. And then we carry on. And of course, then I promptly give them some treasure because it means that I've forgotten to give them treasure or they have forgotten to search the corpses for clues and for treasure itself. So I hope this little 102 on how to run an encounter has helped. I'm not going into the nitty gritty maths of it. There are other channels out there that do that. I'm going into the story of it. And that is for me the most important thing. So until next time, if you like this video, hit the like button. If you want to see more on this series, hit the subscribe button. You can join us on Patreon. And uh, this topic, by the way, came from the uh, www.greatgamemaster.com suggest a topic section where you can go and suggest topics that you would like to see covered uh, on videos such as these in the future episodes. So head on over there. There's a lot of stuff for you to check out. Until next time, happy gaming.